OK, thanks, James and Neil and, and hello, everyone, everyone. Um, so I'm going to give a, a very brief introduction to the uh, the area we're talking about this afternoon. So we're looking at the area of the Trent floodplain um, between uh, Newark running north for about 15 kilometres to South Clifton. Um, so this next slide um, just provides a bit of an overview of the area. Um, it's a slightly arbitrary selection of some of the uh, sort of key sites uh, to, to be found in the area. The, the green crosshatch areas are local wildlife sites and the red are um, sites of special scientific interest. So three, three triple SIs uh, found within the area. Um, mainly privately owned, but a number of um, nature reserves uh, managed by Knox Wildlife Trust, as indicated by the, uh, the logos, and also uh, one of the RSPB's uh, big new reserves, Langford Lowfields. So this is a phase one habitat map um, of the area, which was uh, produced as part of the biodiversity opportunity mapping process, which Janice is going to say uh, a bit more about uh, in her presentation. Um, it is a little bit out of date. Um, it doesn't, for example, pick up the um, extensive reed bed creation work that um, Joe and colleagues are doing at Langford Lowfields. Um, it also, for example, doesn't um, reflect the uh, conifer removal, which has taken place at Spolford Warren, but it does um, demonstrate the sort of fragmented and patchy nature of habitat along the Trent Valley. Um, it also nicely illustrates the impact that quarrying has had on the this part of the, the landscape. So all of these uh, large water bodies at, at Besthorpe and Collingham, at Langford, at Muscombe and over in the north of the area at Girton have all um, arisen through uh, quarrying for sand and gravel, which is an ongoing activity in the area. This slide just provides a, uh, a representation of some of the important habitats found in the area. Um, obviously, wetland habitats are a, a particular uh, priority for conservation activity. So big new areas of reed bed being created at, at Langford, as Joe will talk about more um, later, and also going in at places like Bestthorpe Nature Reserve and, and areas of, of marsh and swamp. Um, so yes, these are primarily associated with, with former quarry areas which have, uh, have been restored. There are some natural water bodies, so I'll, I'll just click back a slide. Sorry, just bear with me. So we have got uh, the fleet at Girton and also uh, some small pools, uh, horse pool, sorry, black pool and um, horse pool over here, which are uh, small remnant water bodies uh, along former uh, meander channels of the of the Trent. Of course, the Trent itself is a dominant feature in the landscape, but is, is heavily canalised and, and constrained by, by its flood banks. Grasslands are also an important feature of the area. So we've got um, areas of moderately species rich grassland like the MG4 meadows um, in the triple SI at, at Bestalt Meadows and also on parts of the, the, the Girton Grasslands local wildlife sites. The acid grasslands on the uh, cover sands. So these are the cover sand sites here at Spolford Warren and Bestalt Warren are uh, particularly important. Um, uh, arisen on areas of, of uh, post-glacial windblown sands, um, which are very localised habitat, also found um, in adjacent parts of um, Lincolnshire. Um, the homes area um, adjacent to, uh, to Girton are extensive areas of, of species poor semi-improved grassland, so not of high botanical quality, but under certain situations, so uh, following flooding events, these areas can be particularly important for uh, for wetland birds and, and waders. There are also small patches of woodland, so oak birch woodland associated with the with the cover sand sites, and there are also um, areas of willow car, uh, which have uh, generally arisen naturally on uh, former uh, colliery, uh, sorry, former sand and gravel uh, silt lagoons. So a good range of, of notable species found in the area. Wet wetland birds are a particular focus uh, focus of the area. So we have sp species like bittern, bearded tit, marsh harrier just starting to get a, a toehold, um, responding to, to targeted habitat creation. Other more opportunistic species like avocet, little ring plover, oyster catcher, et cetera, um, taking advantage of suitable nesting sites in, in active quarry areas. 
Otters are otters are making a comeback and increasingly recorded in the area. Um, water voles, conversely, um, seem to be uh, on their way out, unfortunately. Um, range of notable plants, so things like mudworts and uh, wild clary blue fescue, which all have very localised distributions in the county. Um, invertebrates, as normal, less well studied than other groups. Um, white letter hair streak and purple hair, uh, purple hair streak uh, found. Also moths like uh, the forester at Spalford Warren and uh, Silky Wainscott, which is a, a reed bed specialist found at Langford Lowfields. Um, eel can still be found in the area um, and uh, common lizard and grass snake are found in the uh, in the area around Spalford and Girton. So following on from the previous slide, of course, things never remain static. So despite conservation activity in the area, um, willow tit seems to be lost, lo last recorded at uh, the Muscan pits and, and at Girton. Um, turtle dove has literally disappeared within the last couple of years as a viable breeding species, um, which is uh, obviously fairly tragic, but reflective of, of wider trends. Um, as well as losses, there have been gains. So there were the, the aforementioned um, wetland birds, um, of particular note is uh, little egrets, which um, first bred in Nottinghamshire at Bestthought Nature Reserve in 2013. And with species like great white egret and cattle egret increasingly recorded in the area, um, there may yet be more to come on the, uh, the southern heron front. And then finally, of course, incoming species aren't always good news. So uh, a range of invasive non-native species found in the area, Himalayan balsam along the Trent and the Fleet, uh, New Zealand pygmy weed is uh, an a increasing problem uh, found, I think, now in most of the water bodies in the area. And then we've got a number of species which we need to keep a, a close eye on, which are, are present in the in the surrounding areas. So we've got the uh, Dicrogamus, the, one of the killer shrimps, uh, Chinese mitten crab and uh, quagga mussel. Um, so uh, un underlining the uh, the need for vigilance and uh, control measures where feasible. So I'm now going to hand over to Janice. Thank you, Nick. Oh, hang on. Hopefully, can everybody see that? Uh, yes, we can. That's great. OK, thank you. So I'm going to talk about just briefly about um, some of the sorts of initiatives that are happening now um, to bring wildlife back to this really important area of landscape, what sort of opportunities there, there we currently know about and what there might be in the future, and how we can work to ensure nature's recovery in this area. This is a very whistle-stop tour, obviously, there's an awful lot to cover, and uh, there's many things that there's no time to mention, but you can always contact myself, Nick or Joe, in the future if you want to find out more. <clears throat> So as you've seen, this area of former and current floodplain um, is really important for its complex of nature reserves of really high wildlife value, which form a complex of sites um, that are almost linked together. So between Besthorpe Nature Reserve Meadows, Spalford Warren, Girton Grasslands and Langford Lowfields, we're actually able to conserve and enhance representative habitats of all of the priority habitat types for this area, including wet grassland, open water marsh, reed bed, wet woodland, and very, very rare Aeolian sands habitats. So there's an enormous amount of work underway to manage these reserves, as you can imagine, across the different organisations, from hay cutting, extensive grazing with rare breed livestock, you can see our Lincoln Red cattle there having a little sit down and a, and a graze at Spalford Warren. Reed bed management, scrub management. Those of you who heard my talk this morning know that it's all about the scrub. Um, things like repolliding of ancient boundary willows at Girton Grasslands, hedge laying, flailing. Water level management, absolutely critical for wetland habitats and very, very difficult to do, often because there are external factors you can't control. And there's really important species monitoring that goes on, much of it by volunteers, um, in fact, the most of it by volunteers, and who also do huge amounts of practical conservation work. 
um, none, none of these nature reserves would be able to maintain their value if it wasn't for the hard work that's put in by volunteers. Um, and they're also the crucial eyes and ears on the ground. Nick referred earlier to the success of breeding little egrets at Bestthorpe, and you can see a cute picture there of one of the little egrets being ringed. So they're all ringed and recorded as the herons are there. So this is at Mons Pool, this is a really important mixed heronry with herons, egrets and cormorants all breeding to get breeding in the same place together. The Girton grasslands, these are some of the last remaining fragments of traditional wet water meadows left in the Trent Valley in Nottinghamshire. Incredibly rare. There's six little strips of fields with these big high hedgerows around them. They go, they drop down to a tributary of the River Fleet at the bottom and you get these beautiful wet grassland species rich habitats, but very, very rare. And as the opportunity maps will show you later, and as you'll have seen on Nick's phase one maps, these are tiny fragments now that are left. There's been some fantastic work done in the past in this area, including extensive habitat creation enhancement on these reserves through the lottery funded Trent Valley Landscape Partnership Scheme, through countryside stewardship, landfill tax credits, and a host of other grant making trusts and donations from members of the public too. So some really exciting work's taken place. So you can see there some pictures of a big connection between um, pulverised fuel ash lagoons and the River Trent at Meering that was put in place. So Meering is the northern part of Bessalt Nature Reserve to enable fish passage and control of water levels. And there's also been crucial investments in visitor infrastructure and access. Um, you can see some new structure, relatively new structures there. Because again, as all the speakers mentioned this morning, it's so important that people can enjoy and connect with wildlife and nature easily. You can't protect or conserve what you don't know. So investing in this kind of infrastructure is crucial. So other sorts of work that's been done. Um, here you can see work that was delivered under the Trentvale scheme, which was new reedbed wetland and wet grass and creation at Bestthorpe Nature Reserve. The picture on the right shows you the, the coloured areas of where some quite steep sided and um, areas of the former lagoon at Bessel at Mons Pool were reshaped to create some beautiful shallow new habitats. You can see that in the bottom corner picture, um, which has made an extensive difference to, for example, the value of that site for waders. There's been so a huge amount of investment in the past. Excitingly, we've got a lot to look forward to. Through Seven Trent Water's Great Big Nature Boost, we now have funds for investing in habitats at both Bestthorpe and Spalford Warren Nature Reserves over the next 18 months. So this includes some really important work. Rewetting Bestthorpe Meadows, it should be an alluvial floodplain meadow, beautiful MG4 grassland, but it hasn't been wet enough for at least the last 15 years, largely because of changes in water level management um, upstream, which we can't at the moment influence. Um, but we're looking at other ways of bringing that wetland back through some other interventions to replace that annual alluvial flooding cycle. Um, we're going to be investing in more cattle. For those of you that saw the pictures this morning, we'll be looking at more longhorns and other species, um, particularly at Spalford Warren to help us manage the dreaded scrub there. And we'll be putting in a livestock water supply to enable that to happen much more easily and effectively. Um, and fortunately, we also have funds for much improved habitats and spe habitat and species monitoring. So we can look at what's happening to some of these key species that should be breeding very successfully like red shank, but have been lost from large parts of the county. Lovely wet, you know, wetland bird of wet grasslands, wader of wet grasslands. Um, and we'll be looking at species like woodlark, which have nested in the past at Spalford Warren, and we hope with all our scrub management, there'll be more nesting in the future. You can see our Lincoln Red there with its lovely new collar on. This is a GPS collar that tells us where they're going, where they're feeding, how they're behaving. It makes it easy for them to find uh, or to be found for husbandry purposes. But of course, crucially, it'll help us to better manage these habitats in the future by manipulating where the livestock go to get them to graze even more effectively and help us to do that job. So how does all this work on these reserves fit into the wider landscape? Because we all know that if we're going to bring back nature's recovery, if we're going to hit a target for at least 30 percent of land um, protected or managed for nature by 2030 to tackle the ecological crisis, how does this work? 
So Nick referred to the biodiversity opportunity mapping that we've undertaken in the county as a big bag partnership. Um, on the left there, you can see a map that shows the current habitat network strength for grasslands in this part of the Trent Valley that we're talking about. So the grey blobs with coloured lines around them are areas of existing grassland and the colours tell you what their strength of connectivity is with other similar habitats. So you can see from this that, um, well, on the basis that light green and dark green are the most connected fragment, the most connected areas of habitat, and there aren't any, um, and there's lots of orange and red, that obviously there's an awful lot to do here. This is an essentially arable landscape, which is why we have little fragments of grasslands that are, that are left here. So this network strength mapping was then looked at by the combined brains of over 20 stakeholders to look at where the opportunities might be and that's the map that you see on the right and that shows some of those key areas where we thought we could all work together to try and secure some grassland recreation and enhancement and those are priorities that we're aiming for targeting at trying to seek funds through at different stages of development now similar exercise for wetlands a different picture um, still lots of tiny fragmented habitat. You can see the little red lines which follow the small watercourses. Clearly, though, the trend is very important there as that green line through the middle, showing obviously that there's riparian water's edge bankside habitat all the way through this part of the Trent Valley, unsurprisingly. And you can see how where it's in proximity to Bestthorpe and Langford, if you can see my cursor here in this area, you can see how that actually is potentially quite is already a strong network and some minor interventions in these kind of areas, which you can see reflected on this map, could effectively turn this whole area almost green rather than yellow and um, yellow and amber or red. So some really important mechanisms and unsurprisingly, the reason that these big areas of grey opportunities have, in, have been identified here um, is principally down to habitat creation after minerals, mineral extraction. So there is a shared vision from all these organisations here with our logos at the bottom of the screen for what this might look like. So here in the map on the right, you can see a representation of what the restored habitats joined together at Bestthorpe, Langford and Cromwell, either side of the Trent, will look like when the current approved um, mineral planning schemes come to an end. And for an even wider context, if we're really talking at a, you know, a national or re at least regional nature recovery network scale, you can see this map here is a joint document that covers the Trent Valley all the way from Warwickshire, from its tributaries that run through Birmingham, from uh, where the um, where it joins with the Trent coming in from Staffordshire, from Stoke, all the way through up to the Humber, and showing the contribution to the creation of priority biodiversity floodplain habitats that can be made by each of these mineral restoration schemes, which are shown in these circles. So as you can see, that's a shared picture across all these multiple, multiple partnerships for what this will look like when those mineral schemes come to fruition. And it helps to drive high quality restoration. So this is a big shared vision for bigger, better and connected habitats down the length of the Trent Valley. <coughs> the, the biodiversity opportunity mapping process in this area in the Trent Valley was actually funded by the County Council to inform the development of the Knotts Minerals Local Plan, which is a very forward thinking plan. Knotts were one of the first counties to take this approach. So each new quarry or extension has to substantively contribute to the recreation of these priority floodplain habitats. And you can see here, the gray areas are the current approved quarries and the red areas are the proposed extensions. So you can actually see here how Langford, Cromwell and Bestthorpe will one day eventually all actually join up as a vast wetland landscape. And going further to the north here, this actually links through almost all the way up to the Girton Quarries um, complex as well. So this is a huge opportunity for large scale recreation of lost floodplain habitats. Um, another new opportunity that's come forward for the future, which wasn't really even on all of our radars probably five years ago, 
is that the pulverised fuel ash, which used to be a, a problematic waste product um, because there was too much of it being produced by coal-fired power stations, was put into big wetland holes in the ground after quarrying in the Trent Valley. Um, sometimes restoring land to a surface level rather than to wetlands, which we would have preferred it wasn't filled so much. Um, that's now become a very valuable resource because there's none being made by new power stations. It's very valuable as a, um, a low carbon alternative to cement and concrete. So this is an opportunity for new extraction going forward, potentially, of the PFA that was that was dumped in the in the voids after quarrying in the first place. It just shows that everything comes around and has its time. Environmental stewardship has been a important driver in the management of habitats in the area, particularly for the existing high value wildlife sites. Um, including the privately managed ones such as Best Thought Warren, Triple SI, which has similar habitats to Spolford um, and has had similar interventions such as conifer removal. Um, but stewardship has also helped to fund really important interventions on farmland such as field margin habitats to increase conserve populations of key groups such as red list farmland birds and pollinators. However, if you look at the magic map, which shows areas of land in stewardship for this part of the valley, you can see that bearing in mind the green hatching is entry level stewardship scheme. So this is a very, very basic level of habitat intervention um, and only the areas in orange, yellow and red are areas of more proactive, larger scale sort of habitat creation, you can see here in the valley. Um, most of those are actually focused on reserves like ours here in high level stewardship. Um, so actually, there's very little land in this part of the valley that's in stewardship, which is actually farmland at any of the higher level schemes. So this needs to be a big opportunity going forward as part of the landscape recovery element, particularly of what will be the new environmental land management scheme. Um, where, But we need to recognise that if you're going to take very high value land out of agriculture, obviously farmers need to be want to take part of that and to be properly compensated for it because their businesses, they're, they're, they have businesses to run and families to feed like the rest of us. So the only way to do that will be if the new ELM scheme actually recognises that and pays part farmers properly to reward them for supplying these kind of services such as large scale habitat creation, natural flood management and carbon sequestration. So all of us as part bag partners with our colleagues in Natural England and the EA are working hard to try and make sure that the new environmental land management scheme will recognise the level of investment that's needed in habitat creation on farmland. If we're going to be able to meet, get anywhere near the at least 30% of land um, managed for nature, um, by 2030. There's also been locally um, funded initiatives that have actually helped to do some really important interventions on farmland. So here you can see some um, connections of wetland to the broad fleet um, and pond creation through the Trent Vale Landscape Partnership Scheme that was undertaken. Um, new hedgerow planting and then things like feeding red list birds to our um, our Wildlife Trust Bed and Breakfast for Farmland Bird Scheme. So there's a lot of local initiatives that have gone on and there's the opportunity to do more of this in the future. The Trent Homes, which Janik mentioned, um, could be a really unique opportunity for wet grass and restoration in this area because of the unusual nature of its management and the scale of it. There's been some really good community engagement and involvement in local habitat creation schemes in this area in the past. Again, partly funded through Trent Vale, um, our Blue Butterfly project through other partners investing, such as the councils investing in their local communities. Things like wildflower planting in, old, in, in churchyards. Here you can see restoration pruning of really old fruit trees that, to come to basically conserve them and to ensure that they continue to thrive because they're incredibly important for wildlife. Um, hedge laying, you can see here a training course. So I would like to think that this is a real opportunity going forward and that the number of people who've reconnected with nature as part of perhaps being in lockdown and getting out in their local environment more may mean that there's even more momentum and hopefully funds coming forward to support local community groups and parish councils who want to do to 
improve nature on their doorsteps and to add to that pattern of stepping stones in a nature recovery network. There are a great number of volunteers in this area who do a phenomenal amount of surveying recording of key species group like these shown and many of those are also involved in active conservation work such as reintroduction of um, creeping willow at Spalford Warren for example um, for the rare moths that are associated with it. So again an amazing resource of people here who want to do things for nature and hopefully this is an opportunity. Um, this is part of a really big catchment area, the Lower Trenton Arrow Wash, which is hosted by Trent Rivers Trust on behalf of the Environment Agency. They have, an ex they have an exciting catchment action plan with some good targets to improve water quality and habitats in this area. So if DEFRA, if the government will invest more in catchment partnerships, this is a really good route to deliver habitat and water quality improvements for wildlife because you already have a big network of stakeholders um, who are keen and who want to do this work and have signed up to this action plan. And then looking to the future on that even bigger scale, we're part of an initiative called Wilder Trent with all our wildlife trusts from Warwickshire and Staffordshire to the Humber, with the RSPB, with the local councils, the county councils, um, Trent Rivers Trust and the public sector bodies, Natural England and the Environment Agency, to try and secure funds on the scale needed for some serious habitat recreation and restoration. So you can see the target habitats listed there, the species that are priorities. And we think that by being innovative in the way that we look at funds to try and secure habitat creation from source to sea, um, there are tremendous opportunities going forward. Uh, and we're even only just really starting to explore what biodiversity net gain and carbon credits and natural flood management might look like in this type of large-scale habitat restoration. So now I'm going to hand over to Jo. And attempt to stop sharing. And Jo's going to talk about the great examples of how Langford fits into this vision. That's brilliant. Thanks, Janice. Thank, uh, thank you, Nick, as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jo Harris, Site Manager for the RSPB. Uh, cover the Langford Lowfields Reserve and uh, we're just using it as a bit of a, a case study to highlight how the minerals industry is one of the uh, one of the primary drivers for, uh, for habitat creation along this stretch of the of the Trent Valley. And um, a quick refresh, Langford Lowfields is a partnership project involving RSPB and Tarmac. Uh, we're situated adjacent to the River Trent and just north of Newark on Trent. Um, so over millennia, the Trent has uh, changed course. It used to be a lot wider. And during this time, it's dumped vast quantities of sand and gravel, which are now being exploited by um, quarrying companies like Tarmac. Um, so Tarmac take out the sand and gravel, and then we take on the, um, the, the process of restoring and managing the, uh, the, the land once they've finished with it. So here's an aerial photo showing the reserve as it stands at the moment and um, predominantly a wetland site uh, with a, a beautiful developing reed bed at its heart but around the peripheries we've got other complementary habitats including areas of scrub, a bit of a hay meadow area, some silt lagoons that are succeeding to wet woodland and we've also got uh, an oak dominated area of dry woodland as well. So this is a, a long-standing project between RSPB and Tarmac. Uh, right back in 1988, the initial joint planning application was submitted. Quarrying of the sand and gravel started the following year. And then since then, in a sequential fashion, different phases of the quarry have been uh, worked out. And, uh, and then once all the sand and gravel has been taken, they're restored to create these amazing habitats. So the most recent phase to be restored was phase three, which was restored just a couple of years ago in 2018. So just focusing in on this phase three area, just to have a quick look at how the restoration process happens. We've got these four aerial photos working through and starting in 2004. So back then, this phase three area, just arable farmland, Jumping ahead three years, you can see that Tarmac have started working the area. They've been stripping the soil off and there's a big bund here, a big soil heap with the soil that's been stripped off to expose the sand and gravel. And then the sand and gravel is dug out and sent back to the processing plant along this long conveyor belt. 
by 2015. So this is when I started at Langford. This is how the phase three area looked then. And you can see that most of the site has um, has been worked by that point. And now there are a number of these big soil heaps waiting for the exciting restoration process, which then started in 2018. Uh, so here we go, it's a beautiful aerial photo showing how the phase three area essentially looks now. Uh, so those big heaps of soil that had been um, had been put aside, have been landscaped, they've been leveled out and they've been um, reshaped to create these beautiful wiggly edged islands, uh, which in time will be colonised by reed. And then we're going to end up with uh, it's about 30, 35 hectares of, uh, of amazing reed bed habitat. So the reed at Langford is quite slow to grow because it's growing on the, these, the subsoil from which the islands have been made. And so we need to give the, the reed a bit of a helping hand. And we do this by planting about 10,000 reed seedlings every year. And when the budget allows, this is supplemented by large scale planting of mature reed, uh, including its rhizomes, importantly. So the reed is dug out by an excavator, put into a swivel tip dumper, and then it can be tipped out into pre-dug trenches. So this is out on the phase three area, and the reed that was planted in this fashion is doing really well. So as the reed bed establishes, there's three key reed bed species we're trying to attract. Yeah, the big three. Uh, so these are marsh harrier, bearded tits, and bitterns. So you'll note that they're, uh, they're all bird species. Um, birds are very easy to monitor, um, but they act as brilliant indicators for the overall health of an ecosystem. So the big three, marsh harriers, bearded tits, bitterns, all require slightly different niches within the reed bed habitat. And so we know that if we've got these three species, then the overall health of the reed bed is gonna be really, really good. And we also got other species as well. So otters are being seen on a more regular basis on the reserve. And then excitingly in 2019, we found the first elvers on site. So elvers are baby eels. Eels are critically endangered. Uh, they love reed beds. And so the fact that they started making use of the reserve is really exciting. We had a big new water control structure installed in 2018, which links us to the river. Uh, and it's through this that the eels are now able to, to access the reserve. So one of the brilliant things about Langford is the fact that it, it, um, it hasn't reached its full potential yet, not by a long way. And so the reserve is still evolving, it's still developing. And, and another aerial shot here, you can see the existing reed bed habitats, but uh, I've also included some of the, the plans for the um, upcoming extensions, which uh, are gonna be added to the site within the next 10 years. So. To the west, we've got uh, the western extension, and then to the south, we have the southern extension. And between them, they're gonna add, it's about 70 hectares of uh, wetland habitat to the, uh, to the reserve, which is amazing. Um, and then looking even further ahead, this is pulling in that picture that Janice had in her talk. You can see the red line showing the existing Langford Reserve with the 2023 date indicating the point at which the land is going to be transferred from tarmac ownership to RSPB ownership. Got the, uh, the Western extension there, which should be coming online in the not too distant future. Then the Southern extension. Then importantly, there's an area called the Northern extension, which lies to the, to the north of the existing site. Uh, and this, again, as Janice mentioned, this is going to join us up with Bestthorpe. And then we've got this amazing wetland complex that's developed. Cromwell on the other side of the river, Langford, Bestop and Girton as well. Massive area. It's going to be absolutely incredible. And you'll notice on some of these uh, completion dates for the um, for the extension areas, I have put a question mark. Uh, and this is because things don't always go to plan. We're essentially a massive hole in the ground next to a massive river. And so this year and last year, we've uh, we suffered severe flooding when the rivers come over the flood bank. I've put um two of our fixed point photography pictures here, um, both looking in the same direction, looking westwards across the reserve, so August last year and January this year. I mean, it's, it's not hard to spot the difference. We've got an extra four metres of water on site in the January picture. Um, 
This obviously has a bit of an impact on the reserve, but has even more of an impact on tarmac's operation. And so this is why those uh, completion dates for the extensions are, 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 are questionable at the moment. We don't know how frequently this, this, this flooding is going to happen going ahead. Because this flooding, the, uh, the reserve has been closed now for a number of weeks, but we are excitingly reopening on Monday. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll, um, yeah, some of you will better come and enjoy the, uh, the delights of, of, of Langford once again from, from next Monday onwards.